All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this final week of the 2012 uh, Current Topics in Genomics series. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get to today's lecture. For any of you who missed any of the lectures along the way, uh, just by way of reminder, you can view any of the lectures by just going to the course website, which is, again, at genome.gov slash course 2012, and all of the lectures uh, to date have been posted for uh, viewing. And we're very heartened by the fact that there's already been over 25,000 views of the lectures in this year's series, and I would encourage any of you who are engaged in any sort of teaching activities to use these lectures as an educational resource to supplement your own curricula. Uh, all of the handouts will continue to be available on the website as well until the next offering of this course in the spring of 2014. Um, for those of you who are, uh, have been signing in each week for your CME credits, uh, there is one final thing we have to ask you to do, and that's complete an online questionnaire, which will be hitting your inboxes later this week week, and once we have that in place, we'll be uh, submitting all of the registrations into the CME office so to make sure that you get your credits and a certificate for participating in the course. Uh, for everyone, uh, we also ask that you complete a brief online survey and let us know what you liked about the course, what not so much, any comments that you have about specific lectures, any suggestions that you have for improvement, basically any constructive criticisms that you have regarding any aspect of the course would be welcome. So the survey invitations will go out to everyone on the course mailing list at the end of today's lecture. Uh, please rest assured, all of the survey uh, uh, responses are collected anonymously. Uh, we read each and every one of these survey responses we get back, and the changes that we make based on your feedback uh, from all of you is really a key part of why this course is successful from year to year. So this will take you less than five minutes to complete, so I would very much appreciate your time uh, in completing the survey once you receive the invitation email today. So just in closing, I really hope that you found the course both uh, interesting and informative, and Tira and I really encourage all of you to uh, apply the concepts and the methods that we've presented to you over the last 13 weeks to your own research interests. So thank you for your participation and support, and we look forward to seeing you, all of you again uh, in the spring of 2014 for Current Topics 2014. So to today's lecture, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Julie Segre, who is a senior investigator in the NHGRI Intramural Research Program. And Dr. Segre's main focus is on the body's largest organ, namely the skin. And over the years, her research program has provided us with a great deal of insight about the genetic pathways that are involved in building and in repairing the skin. Now, obviously, the skin provides a critical barrier to invasion by microbes, but it also, at the same time, provides a major home to them as well. And through her lab's work and her work as part of the Human Microbiome Project, Julie's efforts continue to provide us with new insights into how the bacteria that constitute the skin microbiome contribute to both chronic skin disorders, such as psoriasis and eczema, but also to overall human health. So given her role as a thought leader in the field, I'm quite happy that Julie could join us this morning to share with her her perspectives, share with us her perspectives on the genomics of microbiomes and microbes. So please join me in welcoming today's speaker, Dr. Julie Segre. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to just launch right in. And um, so the no financial disclosures, <clears throat> one of the great benefits of being an NIH employee, it makes all that a lot easier. Um, so actually, I I've been involved in the Human Genome Project for uh, 20 years now, and as this part of the Human Microbiome Project really started about five years ago when we started thinking about, you know, the fact that humans are really superorganisms and that the, what's contributing to health and disease is the chromosomes that encode the human, but also the multiple microbes that live in and on our body including fungi, bacteria, viruses, and archaea. Now, of those 23 human chromosomes that you've heard so much about, there's 25,000 genes, you know, I mean, lots of alternative splicing. But in fact, each of those cells has more or less the same gene encoding potential, whereas the microbes that live 
in and on our body actually have quite varied protein coating potential. And as you could imagine, the bacteria that live in your gut are quite different than those that live on your skin. As well, when we start to think about some disorders like allergic disorders, asthma, hay fever, that have really increased in the last 20 to 30 years, it, it can't be our genetic material that's changed in that short of a time span. So it's something about the gene environment interaction, and we use that word a lot, but what really would be integrating this gene environment interaction? And one of the ideas of this project is that perhaps the gene environment interaction is really being integrated by the microbes that live um, as, you know, together with the human cells. And as you could imagine, Although our human DNA is evolving in a very slow way, the microbes that live on us could be evolving more rapidly as we integrate antibiotics into you know, common human health, um, which is to say that you know, my mother probably didn't take antibiotics very much because growing up as a kid during the war, they weren't very um, available. But I took antibiotics as a kid. My children take antibiotics as a kid. So are we going through a bottleneck where we are actually um, changing the microbe, microbial diversity that lives on our human body? And that's really part of it, is just to set a baseline and understand what are the microbes that live on us, how do they change during disease states, and how does that integrate with human health? So um, this is part of the Human Microbiome Project that is a large project um, that is part of the NIH Common Fund, um, uh, born uh, as the NIH Roadmap, that the goal of this project is to assess the microbial diversity of 250 healthy individuals at five sites and to make all of this data publicly available. Um, and the, the data has now been collected, the papers are under review, but the data is already um, publicly available although um, some of the, the data about the clinical um, features of the patients is in controlled access, but the DNA sequencing of the microbes is in open access and would be you know, freely available for anyone wanting to use it as controls for their own experiments. I'm sorry, and the five sites that are being studied are the gut, the nasal passage, the oral cavity, the vagina, and the skin. Um, and in several cases, there are multiple sites like in the oral cavity being sampled so that you could compare uh, the left, you know, the left, you know, the, the left cheek versus the right cheek of the mouth and, um, or the left arm versus the right arm and understand what the variation is between individuals and between sites in an individual. So here the goal is to sequence bacterial reference genomes um, and the first paper on um, the first 180 bacterial reference genomes has been published. And um, here it's, it's really to expand the repertoire of bacteria that have been sequenced. Predominantly bacteria that have been sequenced are ones that are involved in disease. So there's like the MRSAs that have been sequenced are the ones that are circulating in hospital. Um, but what are the or the MRSEs, the staph epidermidis, that have been circulating in hospitals. But what are the bacteria that are part of the normal, healthy human microbiome? And part of the reason for doing these um, bacterial reference genomes is really to enable metagenomics, which I'll get to as the final topic of today. Metagenomics is the, um, the analysis of the combined coding potential of a mixed population. So imagine that, you know, a spaceship comes down in New York City um, in a, you know, in a crowded uh, street where people are crossing the street and basically sucks them up and takes the DNA from all of them simultaneously. You know, that's what metagenomics is. Like you would just be scraping your skin and sequencing everything. And then you try to sort out which one came from which genome. Um, so instead of sequencing microbe by microbe, we'd like to eventually sequence altogether the entire gene encoding potential of the bacterial community 
because there is such an interaction between the bacteria of how they control and interact with each other. The goal is also to look at the correlation of changes in the microbial communities with disease states. So there's some classic projects being looked at here, um, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, um, psoriasis, eczema, um, and you know, really to understand what is the relationship of, of these disease onsets with bacterial communities. Now it's very interesting because in fact, what we're seeing now is that it's not just that the bacteria of the gut controls gut disease, but in fact they're seeing that enzymes produced by the gut are having an effect on coronary heart disease because um, drugs that are used to treat coronary heart disease or um, even products that contribute to coronary heart disease are metabolized by bacteria um, that inhabit the gut. Similarly, oral cavity seems to have an effect on multiple systems of the body. So we're beginning to understand that the immune system is educated by the microbes, but also faraway sites are being affected by the microbes. As well, we're really, um, as with the Human Genome Project, we, we're taking this project um, and also exploring the ethical, legal, and social implications of this field of research. So, for example, it's really unclear how probiotics will be regulated in this um, country. That is to say that right now, um, probiotics can be um, used as drugs if they go through the full IND process of a, of a drug. But it's very hard to do that. But on the other hand, if you, uh, most of the things that you'd buy in Whole Foods are actually being regulated just as natural products or food additives. And therefore, there's not the same level of clinical scrutiny on the manufacturing and um, the um, e efficacy of those. So, you know, that's one of the things that we're looking at as part of the project is how to really regulate probiotics. Also, what will people think about, you know, how can we change um, the impressions of people in this country and that, you know, there are these nasty bugs out there that you certainly would want to avoid, but it's not necessarily that the language of warfare is always applicable here. There are lots of healthy bacteria and our goal should not be to just kill them all. And it's interesting because, again, people are very interested in the probiotics that go into their gut and then they want to sterilize their exterior um, using all these, you know, hand sanitizer products, which are, have their role, but, you know, we can't lose sight of the fact that hand washing has been, um, you know, extremely f effective and been really tested over the years. So the, how did this project start? Well, really, the microbial diversity has been studied in the environment for decades before the Human Microbiome Project started. And these are just some early articles about microbial diversity that was studied in the environment, where um, in this example they go around and they're taking all these um, different um, spots in the Sargasso Sea and they're looking at what the microbial diversity is. And what they found here was that by DNA sequencing, you could recover a much greater diversity of microbes than you could by culturing. And we call this, um, this has been well known also, you know, suspected in human studies, which we call the great plate count anomaly. That, you know, you can see when you take a sample that there's a great diversity of bacteria, but when you try to grow them up, they're really not as diverse as what you could see in the original sample because you really have certain bacteria that are really lab weeds. You know, and for the skin, it's really the staphylococcus that just grow tremendously well when you put them on, you know, auger plates and let them grow as um, individuals. And these um, environmental samples have been sampled, you know, that was studying different places in the Sargasso Sea, but this is another one, which is a saline mat where they sample at all these different sites as you go down in depths of the mat, and they're looking then at what are the biological functions that are being performed. These sorts of things are also being done in the ocean at different depths, and what you can see is the effect of you know, sunlight because you go from much more um, um, photosynthesis to less, 
and, and those kinds of processes that you can really see the extent to which the bacteria are responding to the environment. Oops. Okay, so um, there's the, you know, the environment of the oceans and the sea, but there's also the environment in which the humans live. And um, we rarely, you know, think about this, but this was an um, experiment that Norm Pace's lab did where um, they went and tested shower heads um, all over the U.S. Um, and um, look to see what was in shower heads. Now this is an example of something where you think you're standing in the shower and you are you know, getting clean. And in fact you are, but no one in their home um, very commonly changes the shower head. Um, and it turns out that that is a, a moist, warm environment that we are creating um, in our homes that really has a great potential to grow bacteria. So, Part of this is also to think about where are the, you know, environmental point sources. And it turns out that there's lots of bacteria that live in your shower head um, and that some of the bacteria are dependent on what type of shower head you have. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you should run off and um, change your shower head, um, although I I've often meant to do that after reading this <laughs> article. Um, so. How do we look at bacterial diversity? I mean, you know, there's the culturing, but now what we've entered is this realm where we think that the DNA sequencer is a very powerful microscope that can tell us what are the bacteria that are in a certain place. So the way that we look at the bacterial diversity is by, is by sequencing the 16S rRNA gene. So ribosomes, as I'm sure you're, you all know, are made up of proteins and these ribosomal RNAs that guide the, the tRNAs through. And a ribosome is actually 70% um, ribosomal RNA, um, and the crystal structure has been solved, and that's been, you know, really one of the beautiful works of biology. Um, but these 16S um, ribosomal RNAs, which means that they're not translated into proteins, but they have a lot of secondary structure because they're part of this ribosome. Um, and the 16S rRNA gene has been used as a, a signature for bacterial genes for a very long time because um, there are regions that are more highly conserved because they have to form these stems um, and there are regions that are less conserved because they form these loops. But in fact, there is a phylogenetic distinction where all the firmicutes are more like each other, and then all the staphs are more like each other, and all the streps, streptococcus are more like each other. And you can use the 16S sequence, the similarity, to go from the phylum to the order to the family to the genus to the species level. And so it's the 16S gene that Carl Woese and then Norm Pace really developed as a, a molecular signature for bacterial diversity. And um, I'm just going to sort of spend the first part of this talk talking about how we use the 16S gene for um, characterizing bacterial diversity. So here's another display of that same um, uh, 16S gene. And what you can see here is that, again, I've laid out the 16S gene. It's 1,500 base pairs. And I've laid it out where you can see now what is the, um, you know, what's the sequence similarity of these different regions. So like these regions up here are those stem regions, you know, that have to be highly conserved. They probably interact with the tRNAs. And you really just can't, you know, you don't have much wiggle room on those. But then there are other regions, and you can see that they vary, that um, are very highly diverse or less diverse. Now, in fact, we use different regions to get different levels of specificity in that these most diverse regions are sometimes hard to use if you want to get to the level of phylum or something because they are so variable. Um, <clears throat> And I'll, I'll kind of go through that. But the first thing is that sometimes you just want to know how much bacterial, bacteria is there. And so quantitative PCR um, uh, primers have been designed 
that are in fairly conserved regions that you can put ends in and you can get most of them um, to, to then do a qPCR and figure out like for example is you know does do these mice have a greater bacterial load than these mice or does this site on the human you know like the oily sites of the human skin have a greater bacterial load than the dry sites um, so actually this needs to be sort of standardized and um, so for example this is how um, we calculate the bacterial load where we actually took bacterial DNA um, and you know using Avogadro's number we figured out you know how many picograms of DNA we were putting in of the bacterial DNA and then um, spiked that with an increasing amount of human DNA because when you get samples some you know a some of those samples have a significant amount of human DNA in them. And then we did the qPCR curve, where as you increase, um, sorry, as you decrease the amount of bacterial DNA um, by tenfold, you're now increasing the number of cycles by three and by three again. Um, and from this, we can calculate what the bacterial load is. So for the skin, we were wondering, um, which as Dr. Baxavanis mentioned is my um, labs area focus, we were wondering, you know, how much bacteria were we getting by the different methods. So with this, we were able to calculate that when you swab someone's skin with like a Q-tip, you can release 10,000 bacteria per square centimeter, whereas if you scrape the skin, so removing that like white, um, that, that the, you know, the white things that um, form the dust bunnies in some people's bedrooms, um, that would yield 50,000 bacteria, but if you use a biopsy, you'll actually generate a million bacteria per square centimeter. And that's because the bacteria don't just live superficially, they in fact live very deep into the skin in the hair follicles and the sweat glands. Um, so you can generate more, although um, you, you, you don't need to because um, we can get most of our answers with a lower, um, a, with a subsample of the bacteria. So, when you're thinking about how to study microbial diversity, um, there's really an emerging, you know, this is, this is sort of one of, the, um, one of the questions that's really been emerging is how do you study microbial diversity? So the earliest studies would take the 16F DNA, they'd amplify it, and then they'd do sort of a fingerprint. And based on the number of fragments, they'd calculate how many different types of 16S gene they had. But that's really based on the limitation of a gel. So that's the cheapest method, but it's very limited in, in resolution. Um, the, the phylo chip or the geo chip are kind of like microarrays, where they have the different 16S sequences laid out on a slide. Um, and you can use that to say, I have this much of, you know, the staph epidermidis, this much of the strep agalactae, this much of the strep pyogenes. Um, and, and I think that, you know, this will, this not only has a, a role right now, but it has a continuing role in that the um, analysis of these types of microarrays is often much easier than using um, sequence analysis. But the problem is that with any of these microarrays, you are only going to find what you know is already there. Um, and you'll never find the unique species. So what we need in order to build these chips is a very good reference library of what are all the possible bacteria that could be found on this site so that you can interrogate that rather than thinking, you know, well, you know, you'd hate, you'd hate that the population you were looking at had some unique bacteria and you're just not assaying it. So that brings us to sequencing. Because sequencing is, you know, gene discovery. This is how, you know, you can find, um, uh, you know, a full dynamic range and compare multiple complex samples. So for a small, for a small study, um, you know, the, the sequencing may be limiting, but for a large study, and I would actually even say for a small study also, the bioinformatics becomes limiting as you go through this. Because um, most of the programs that I'll talk about for sequence analysis um, do require you to kind of 
dive right into this and um, do you know some of this command line programming, or you know at least run it on the command line, um, and have some understanding of what may be the issues associated with your sequencing. So this is an example of Philochip, just to show you how this type of data can be used if this is you know, the, the type of experiment you want to use. Um, this was looking at the intestinal microbiota in the first year of life of, um, <clears throat> of children. So on the x-axis is days, and on the y-axis is you know, the percent of sequences in a relative abundance that um, belong to um, these um, classes of bacteria. And, you know, the, the punchline of the story was that there's great diversity between infants and between time points with these sort of spikes that you can see, these blooms here, um, and that that is part of the normal process, that for infants, as you, as, as you can, you know, imagine, the, the child makes major shifts as they go from, um, uh, breast milk to cereal to, you know, eating a diverse diet, much as they do on their skin microbe, um, their skin microbes as they go from always being held to being seated to then crawling around and exploring their environment. Um, also to say that as they are infants, they have these like rolls of fat and then their skin kind of changes as they um, start running around and become leaner. So something like Philochip can give you this overall perspective of what is, you know, the microbial diversity over time and how, you know, how stable is it. Um, so, but if we want to get to sequencing, it again becomes this issue of where are we going to put our primers. Um, in terms of you want the primers to have the specificity that you could, um, amplify as many of the types of bacteria as possible, um, accepting the fact that there will always be some um, uh, amplification bias of any primers. But you put the primers into conserved regions, and then the phylogeny is determined by the variable regions. Um, and the size of these amplicons is really, again, technology limited. So if you were using Sanger sequencing, um, doing, you know, amplifying the 16S gene, doing a ligation, and having it sequenced with Sanger sequencing, then you, you might, um, and you know, what many of the early studies did was amplify the full length 16S. Um, but most projects, if not all projects, have now um, switched over to the pyro sequencing, and the Human Microbiome Project has been using the V6 V9 region, um, there's actually a V3, V5 primer set, and also from the 5 prime end of the gene that's not shown here, there's actually um, a conserved region here into the V3 region. Um, and one of the things I would say is that um, there is a, a fair amount of variability. So if you take the same sample and amplify it with the V1, V3 primers, at the five prime end and that same sample and go for the middle region and go for the end, they, they aren't going to be exactly the same. Some of those primers um, are better at amplifying firmicutes, some of them are better at amplifying um, uh, the streptococcus, some are um, better for uh, lactobacillus. And so really the region that you pick is often driven by what type of bacterial diversity you are expecting to see in your sample type. For example, we for the skin always use the V1, V3 primers because it's very important to us to get a very good handle on the Staphylococcus. That's just one of the important bacterial genera um, in uh, skin diseases, including atopic dermatitis. But for people who are studying vaginal um, microbiota, they may use the V6, V9 region because that gives them better resolution. Also for the oral cavity, they typically use the V1, V3 because they need to differentiate the different streptococcus. So what region you use is often dependent on what body sites you're looking at. However, that does bring up an issue 
that if you are sequencing the V3, V5 region, you can't use as a reference someone who studied healthy controls but sequenced the V6, V9 region. You may find that there are great differences between your disease state and the healthy controls, but that really could be driven by primer choice rather than by um, uh, the disease state. So these are some of the, the complications of um, these, these studies, is that we are still um, utilizing um, these kinds of sequencing um, techniques that clearly have biases. Um, so I, I, sort of, I sort of said this, but just to um, reiterate, there's the Sanger sequencing, there's 454. Um, and I, I, I would say keep your eye on Illumina. Um, the, the, the sequencing read length of a, you know, 70 to 100 base pairs has often been too short to really get that much specificity from Illumina. But um, especially now as the MySeq comes online um, and people get paired ends of two times 150, the, you know, sequencing 150 base pairs from the V3 and 150 base pairs from the V1, you're getting in exactly the same range as the 400 base pairs of a 454 Roche. As those read lengths go up to 200 base pairs, 250, you're going to be getting a much more powerful data set from Illumina at a much lower cost than you are from the 454 Roche. It's not clear that as you go, if, you know, if Roche really does go up to 600 or 800 base pairs of DNA, in an amplicon, whether that 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 um, additional sequence would really be um, useful and important for do sequencing the 16S gene, because you typically get enough resolution to get all the way to the species level um, with 400 base pairs, and that's sort of laid out here. Although um, in in this reference where they talk about you know the sequence length, and if you just had 50 base pairs. You, you may not really be able to get even to the genus level, but you could get to the phylum level. So it really depends um, the sequence length and um, the primers that you could then use and how that really, what type of specificity you want for your bacterial diversity sequencing. Maybe it's enough for you to just even know, has there been a shift in the phylum or the class? Um, and then you can think about using different sequencing platforms. Okay. So you've got a sequence, and you know, the, you know, you've got a sequence. Let's say you've got a 400 base pair sequence, you know, or you have 2,400 base pair sequences. Well, you, you can't just blast them anymore, and um, this is kind of frustrating to a number of people who work even in clinical microbiology labs. You used to be able to blast something and get it to match something, but by now, so much bacterial sequencing has been dumped into BLAST um, that if you put in a sequence, I mean, when we put in a sequence and we're trying to say what is the sequence, what we usually get is that this matches thousands of other sequences that our lab has deposited into GenBank that are uncultured. And you know, it just comes back uncultured skin bacteria. Well, that really doesn't actually help us that much. Um, and so, um, this is one example where um, more data has actually, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's great, but it has gone beyond what you can do with BLAST. So, um, you know, fortunately there is a solution, which is that bacterial sequences do have their own classification systems. Um, and, and this is not, um, you know, this is, uh, I, I refer you here that there are these tutorials which actually will take you through this. We have the Ribosomal Database Project that was curated by Jim Cole's lab um, and contains approximately a million 16S sequences that have all been classified based on, um, you know, common microbiology technique, taxonomy. Um, and you know, I, I do get into this because for clinical microbiologists there are different taxonomic um, systems. There's Berg 
um, Bergies, Usabi, NCBI, but they're basically, you know, the Phil Hugenholtzes, they're basically the same. Um, you know, you will find bacteria that they've been reclassified or renamed, um, and you can look into all of that. But so within RDP, um, you can find what is the bacterial classification. You can do things like find probes if you want to um, uh, find something to, to, you know, try to make either a, a, a little microarray or to do in situ hybridization. You can do seek match. But basically, by this point, you need to move into um, these kinds of bacterial programs because um, BLAST is now quite limited. So this is just an example of sort of, of the RDP um, pyrosequencing pipeline where the data is processed and um, formatted. And then RDP will already um, give you uh, um, some of the analysis tools that tell you um, from a sample, how diverse is this sample? Have you sequenced enough to um, achieve saturation? And I'm gonna kind of go through some of those. But it, you know, it's a sort of, it's, a, it, it's one of those projects that, uh, one of those programs that will, will take you sort of soup to nuts. Okay, um, if you are dealing with human sequences, um, then for 16S, I would say that we very, rarely, almost never, end up amplifying human DNA um, with those 16S primers. But it is something that you need to have a filter in because ethically you, you um, really, because we release all our data into the public, um, there's, a, there's a distinction in when we consent patients that we would, we would um, put their microbial sequence in um, open access, but we wouldn't put their human DNA into open access. So um, just sort of a shout out that, you know, one of the issues is to really think about that. So at the level where I was saying that you could um, uh, gain insights even from the highest level, this is an early paper from Jeff Gordon's lab looking at what is the difference between um, lean mice and obese mice, and these are genetically obese mice. They have a mutation in the leptin pathway. Um, and what you can see, even at this level, the shift is quite great. So what um, the, the Gordon lab can see here is that the, oops, well, that's not good. Um, the obese mice have an increase in the amount of firmicutes and a decrease in the amount of bacteriodetes. And um, that it's really this kind of a wide sweep. Now, um, actually, some of the, the most interesting things that are now coming out in my studies are how um, the effect of having the mice in the same cage affects them, in that mice um, will, um, are caprophytic. They will eat each other's poop, and that actually kind of um, makes their microbiomes conform. Um, so you can actually even see differences. If mice are um, housed in the same cage, they are much more consistent than if they are in individual cages. And they will go towards a norm if mice are in the same cage with each other. Um, and they can actually even transfer the microbiome from an obese mouse to a lean mouse. Um, uh, and those sorts of things, actually, Richard Flavel was here. Um, two weeks ago talking about um, experiments that he's done with Jeff Gordon's lab on that topic. Um, so again, it, it is very interesting when you start to think about setting up mouse studies, um, you have to think about um, how you're housing them because these microbiomes are not unique to the mouse. There is a community aspect to these microbes. Now, in humans, I would say we are just at the beginning of studying this. You know, there are these sort of small studies that report that you know a couple living together will start to conform to the same, um, si or not to the same, but to a similar microbiome. Um, and certainly, the twins have greater similarity, um, either monozygotic or dizygotic twins, than um, siblings. It, it, you know, so we're just at the beginning of understanding how microbes are shared between people, 
with mice, there's um, uh, a, a lot more sharing that goes on. So um, the, the studies on obesity are also have been shown now in um, humans. This was sort of a, one of the studies that kind of got a lot of press when it came out uh, five years ago, looking at what are the bacteria that um, live in the human gut. And uh, this is sort of these people where they are put on a, on a diet um, and as they become leaner, um, the amount of bacteria deets increase and the amount of firmicutes, wait, sorry, the amount of bacteria deets increases and the amount of firmicutes decreases. Um, and that is correlated with changes in the body weight. Um, but, you know, I mean, Jeff is very clear on this, and I, so I want to be, you know, sure to say this, that, you know, in terms of weight, the microbes are, um, you know, playing a role and perhaps being uh, educated and selected by the diet that you are picking, but there is still a tremendous role here for uh, what your diet is and how many calories you are consuming in terms of body weight. Um, so uh, it, it, it's not to say that microbes are the whole story if, you know, if you're um, consuming many more calories than you need. Um, okay, so coming back to sequence analysis, this is another um, one of the dirty little secrets about bacterial sequence analysis, which is chimeras. When you're doing PCR to look for the 16S gene, and this would be true even if you were sequencing or if you were going to a phylo chip or any other means, you are starting, you know, by by amplifying a, a staphylococcus, the PCR um, cycle is over. You're not yet done amplifying this 400 base pair product. Um, and then when the next round of PCR starts, you have you know, almost an exact sequence identity at the three prime end of that um, gene or that product to match any other sequence in there. So these are what chimeras will look like where you start, you know, by amplifying parent, you know, start by amplifying parent B, and then you switch over, and now you're amplifying parent A. So the reason that chimeras are this dirty little secret and are so um, pernicious is that um, when you're thinking about how diverse is my sample, um, we did a, an experiment where we took 20 known bacteria and we mixed them together and we did the 16S PCR. And we generated thousands of unique bacterial sequences by generating chimeras between the sequences. And so when you think about how diverse is my sample, we knew in that case we had only put 20 bacteria in, but because of the multiple ways, you know, that a chimera could be formed either, you know, here with the here or here or here. Those each would be viewed as unique sequences. So you can't um, consider how diverse is your sample without correcting for chimeras. Um, and we used these 20 um, bacterial DNAs that had been all integrated together to then use that as a, as a training set to um, um, develop a chimera detection program. Um, uh, and the one that basically everyone is using now is called Chimera Slayer. There were other programs earlier, Pintail and something else and something else. But really, this is the, um, the, the most well-tested um, uh, program by now. Um, and um, it really reduces, oh sorry, Bellerophon was the other one. And it really reduces the, um, the false sequences that you could otherwise generate with that kind of PCR amplification. So then you, you wanna figure out like how many different bacterial species do you have in this sample? And so you have to start binning the sequences. And you wanna start by doing an alignment of your sequences um, 
But these 16S sequences, we know a lot about the structure of a ribosomal RNA, and we want to use that information to generate an alignment. So many of the alignment programs that have been generated for looking at um, DNA sequence are based on the fact that they should form a protein, and that therefore you would penalize something that had a one base pair insertion or deletion, because that would f throw off the frame shift. But what we know about the 16S gene is that there are gaps, um, and that those gaps in the different regions might mean something different. So if you have a gap in a stem, that actually should be penalized more than if you have a gap in the loop, and, um, and, and also indels may not be as, you know, they may not be that different than here where you have, um, you know, a base pair that doesn't, um, you know, match up. So, um, again, this is something that the Human Microbiome Project has worked hard on to sort of come up with a fixed with character alignment format, NAST, um, and again, um, NAST was the original program that really, you know, just specifically is designed for aligning 16S sequences. Um, NAST has now been um, uh, changed um, or, you know, made better, um, and it's now called Nastier, which again is from the Broad site. And um, NAST is the original alignment um, based on this ribosomal database project, you know, the um, the, the curated data set. Nastier, the, the difference is that Nastier now allows you to have, um, if you have paired end sequencing and you don't have the middle region, it doesn't count, it doesn't penalize you for putting ends in the middle of your sequence. You can still um, do that type of alignment and it, it um, is uh, aware of um, that, that you could have a gap in your sequence. Um, so the, the, the thing is that what you have now is that you have these sequences aligned, but now you want to build a phylogenetic tree and you want to calculate the branch length between each of these um, sequences and, and start to bin them. And for this, um, typically people are using ARB, which is based on the Silva database, to build the phylogenetic tree. Um, and. So you'll end up with a, um, a parsimony-generated dendogram, um, and then this tree is then input into the next step, which is typically to define these taxonomic groups by sequence similarity. And now you kind of, I mean, and, and actually now Mother, there's two programs. There's Mother and there's Chime, and I'll, I'll sort of get to Chime. Either one of these is, again, now this whole sort of soup to nuts program of how to do everything from taking your bacterial sequences and bringing them through to an analysis and a visualization and a display tool. Um, but Mother will take your sequences and it will group them, once you have that phylogenetic tree, it will group them based on what sequences are what, you know, are, are similar to each other. And you can set that similarity and you can say, I want to, you know, I want the groups to be 99% identical. I want them to be 97% identical. And again, it depends on what level of, um, of specificity you want to have. Um, a lot of our projects will look at 99%. Other projects will look at 98, 97%. And you do sort of want, it, 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 it is a craft. It's like fact sorting. You know, if you say you want 99% similarity, you will have many more groups. And it's really about what level of specificity are you trying to do your analysis. The other thing that you have to be aware of when you're forming these taxonomic groups is the nearest neighbor joining method versus the furthest neighbor joining method. And all of this is really documented and explained, but furthest neighbor means that um, the, any two sequences have to be at least 99% identical to each other, whereas um, the other method means that you kind of pick a root sequence and th these two can be 99% identical and these two can be 99% identical, but then these two other sequences might be 98% identical to each other. How that becomes as important is if you think about what the error rate of the sequencing um, instruments is. If 
you know, in other applications, when you think about the sequence error, it is not as big of an issue because you are often doing an alignment and you're looking at multiple reads of the human genome, you know, and you have like 50 reads of this region of the human genome. And you're then saying 25 of them are A's and 25 of them are C's. And you call the genotype as AC. But in our case, again, like I stressed about this issue about chimeras, each one of these sequences is being taken as its own sequence that is uniquely representing a single bacteria. So we don't have the same way where we are correcting sequencing errors. And probably the more realistic view of the human genome data would be instead of 25 A's and 25 C's, you'd be getting 24 A's, 24 C's, one G and one T, and you ignore the G and the T. We don't have a reference by which to know whether this is improbable or not. There could be one bacteria out of 25 that actually does have a G at this position. So again, this is where um, you have to kind of under, you know, understand the data and start to think about um, the number of sequences um, this is old Sanger data, I can see, because you know now we would no, we would no longer take it up to 140 sequences. It would be going to you know 3,000. But the the the, um, the idea remains the same. That you look at the percent. You know, if you're looking for 100 percent identity, then you know, is what you're measuring here um, sequencing errors, or is what you're measuring here actually? Um, bacterial diversity. So most experiments classified the 97 or the 99 percent identity. Okay. Now when we do the, the types of analyses, there's really two different types of um, methodologies that we can use, and these are the most common. We look at community membership, um, which um, the term jacquard. It, it's, it's known as the jacquard and the community structure is the theta. But these are two different ways of looking at the data sets. I've sort of diagrammed it out here, pretending that we're talking about a fruit bowl. And the question that you would ask here is, you've got these two fruit salads. And if I want to say how, what categories of fruit do they have in common, and this would be like, you know, do they all have streptococcus? Do they all have staphylococcus? I would say actually they're not that similar because only two out of five of the communities are shared between the two groups. But if I said, you know, then the other way of saying it is the community structure. If I took, you know, if I took 100 pieces of fruit out of, you know, the first fruit bowl, would I find, how many of those 100 pieces of fruit would I find in the second bowl? And there the answer is about 90%. So the question is, what's important? Is it community membership or is it community structure? If you think about two bacterial communities, um, whether or not they are similar probably has to do with what kind of protein encoding potential they have. And so you'd think about community structure. But if what you want to say is, does this bacterial community have the population, have the potential to bloom and maybe there's some um, infectious, you know, bacteria that certain people are susceptible to having these kinds of infections and other people aren't, then you're worried about community membership because it could be a bacteria that's there at very low levels but under other circumstances could bloom and suddenly you have a staph aureus, you know, infection. So that's what you want to look at. So we typically calculate both of these and then we look at, um, you know, th they can be used for very different types of um, questions. Um, this is an example of using the community membership, where what we are, um, what, um, again, this data is showing, and it's um, looking again at those obese mice. It's laying out that this is um, the genotype of the animal, but then also it's which mother is it from. So um, M11, M12, and M13, those are the pups of this mother one. And these are the pups of, oh, sorry, that's too small even for me to read. That's the, those are the pups of mother three, 
um, and mother three clustered together, the pups of mother one and mother one clustered together, and mother one and mother three are sisters. So what you see here is that at the level of community membership, pups are most like their mothers, and the next step is that they are most like their cousins if their mothers are sisters. Um, and so this is saying that microbes are inherited, at least in mice, microbes are inherited from their mother. But when we looked at a mouse mutant, um, what we saw was that with community structure, um, and you saw this also with the OB mice versus um, the wild type mice, that they are most like other mice of the same genotype because what bacteria they have may be defined by their mother, but the proportions of those bacteria are then defined by their genotype. So that's why community membership and structure can give you different types of information. Um, and um, unifrac-like mother, this is part of CHIME now, these are, um, they're, I would say these are sort of um, uh, two of the most highly used methods, unifrac and mother, for generating these same kinds of data. This will get you the same, um, you know, um, calculating the branch length, giving you statistical analysis, um, and um, it, it generates the same kind of data. Again, I always think it's useful to use two independent methods to look at your data sets because if you see, um, you know, something being statistically significant with one method and with another method, you have additional confidence that you're really looking at something real. Um, how much diversity is there in the population? Here we calculate um, these rarefaction curves where we just say, you know, how many, um, how many um, OTUs am I seeing as I add additional sequences and how many would I predict? And again, here what we're seeing is that that's very dependent on the um, body site. As you delve into it, we have um, measures for all of these things. These are pretty much have been developed from um, environmental sequencing. So the richness is the number of OTUs or you know, species. The um, diversity accounts for, um, sorry, the evenness um, is the distribution. Do you have, you know, 90, 1, 1, 1, or do you have 10, 10, 10, 10, 10? Um, and then Shannon diversity, which is pretty much what people um, put out there. The Shannon diversity index takes into account the richness and the evenness. So all of these are the kinds of um, um, ways that you would characterize the community structure beyond even saying what are the bacteria um, and that people use to talk, to compare. So this is an example of um, work from my own lab where we looked at um, a survey of what are the bacteria on the different parts of the human skin. And what you can see here, this is um, those plots from the um, RDP where each of the bacteria are just classified at the phylum and then genus level. And what you can see is the blue sites here are the oily sites, and they have a high preponderance of these propionobacterium, which are lipophilic bacteria. Um, the moist sites, these creases, have a lot of the carinobacterium, and also in cases um, have a lot of the staphylococcus. Um, and the dry sites, um, which are you know, typically the, well, the buttocks and the arms, th those actually have the greatest diversity. So you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can look at all these communities. This is probably an easier way to see that. Now, if I'm showing you four different healthy volunteers, you can see again that all four of them have a lot of propionobacterium on their back. Um, and you know, what you could really see from here, the um, antecubital crease is the bend of the elbow. So you could see that um, you know, these people, their backs are more similar to each other than their back is to their arm. Um, and then really what we see from this is that the ecology of the site is dominating what bacteria live there rather than the individual. So the bacteria are responding to, is this an oily site, is this a dry site, more than um, who is this that I'm living on. Because in general, humans um, provide many different microbiological niches for um, bacteria.
This is an early analysis of um, the different ha habitats. And um, the colors here, um, uh, the, the greens up here, these are all sites from the oral cavity. These are all from the gut. And then these are different sites from um, the skin, including hairy sites and inside the ear. And you know, there is wider diversity than you see for the oral cavity and for the gut. But what you see here is basically, again, at a higher level, it is the body site that is defining what bacteria live there. So um, stay tuned for um, an, um, you know, further insights from the Human Microbiome Project and further tool development. Um, that was talking a lot about bacterial diversity. We're also doing work to look at fungal diversity. Um, fungi are eukaryotes that have an ATS and an ITS um, intervening transcript sequence. Um, and we're using, trying to adopt the same methods that we did for bacterial sequences to look at fungi um, um, because there's probably a tremendous amount of a relationship between the bacteria and the fungi. So, um, now I'm going to talk about sequencing bacterial genomes, and um, this sort of goes hand in hand. But again, I would say that these sequencing instruments that are coming online um, and that are, you know, you know, present in many of the sequencing centers and may come into people's labs also soon, these are really ideal for sequencing microbial genomes. Microbial genomes are about three to six million base pairs. And um, the type of data that you get from, an, uh, you know, from a high seek or from a Roche is really perfect. You get a lot of depth of coverage and um, they're fairly affordable to do now. So what you, you get is you get these short reads, and I know other people have talked about that, um, and you then uh, um, uh, align these reads into context. There are also um, ways that you can get paired end reads, and um, depending on the, the size of the paired end read, you can bridge these contigs. Um, there are several different assemblers that are used for um, assembling bacterial genomes. This is also sort of fairly out of the box. We just use standard assemblers. Um, and um, the, you know, it, it really is for these that you can make a library, get your, you know, give, give your DNA, make a library, and um, for many of these instruments, you will now get back large contigs of DNA sequence. Now, you don't get back a, you know, finished total reference genome. Um, Velvet is another one that we've used. Um, um, and, you know, so, you do have to think about, you know, what level of coverage that you need, um, so how big are the contigs going to be and how many of them are there. And you have to sort of start thinking about that because, and you, you kind of need to pilot that, that for a six megabase genome, you can make these calculations of how much sequence you would need, but there are things that break contigs. Like any time you have a ribosomal um, RNA Operon that will break the contig because what ha there are many of those copies of that in a gene genome and you aren't sure if you start on this contig and you hit the 16s operon or the rRNA operon you know if there's five copies of that you don't know then which uh, is the next contig that you're going into um, so and transposons phage insertions there are things like that that will just break contigs. Um, but we also can use that information to try to generate information about um, what is the genome that we're looking at. So here's a Staphylococcus genome that we sequenced in the lab. And what you can see here, this is the contig length, and you can see that most of the contigs are here, and I'm sorry, I can't even read this, but this is sequenced at about 30-fold depth. And you can see most of our contigs are this size. We don't really trust anything that's, you know, a, 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 a tiny contig. But what you can see is that over here, this sequence, um, these three all assemble, is present at two times the, the amount as the other parts of the DNA. This is found at five times, and these are plasmids that are high copy. And that gives you an idea that these encode um, 
non, either, you know, repetitive sequences or plasmids that are in the genome. Um, one of the things that we have found um, as a field, um, you know, people talk about staph epidermidis, or they talk about streptococcus agalactae. And morphologically, they look indistinguishable, different, you know, isolates will look indistinguishable by traditional biochemical means. But then what you can see is that, you know, you know some of them have drug resistance to this or that, but they also sometimes have different invasive properties. And so what we find is that, in fact, there is a pan genome where Something like a strep agalactae, when you sequence, um, and this project was based on sequencing, here when you sequence like 11 or 12 of these genomes, what you see is that um, about 80 percent of the genes are found in every genome. Um, but this is looking at, um, so the, the number of core genes as you start sequencing, you know, you'll find that there are approximately 1,800 core genes. But in fact, each of these genomes has an additional 200, I'm sorry, 400 genes that aren't part of this core genome. Those are sort of a random mixture that are found in some of them, but not others of them. That's called the flexible genome, the open genome, the variable genome. But what we basically are seeing is that, of course, we talk about bacteria as species, but they're not engaging in, you know, um, sex. I mean, this is, you know, this is that they can switch around their, back, their genetic information with recombination, horizontal gene transfer. They don't have the same constraints. So there are bacteria that are, you know, extremely similar, but there also are a lot of bacteria that have a core genome and then have a flexible genome. And that actually starts to get at why perhaps are some strains more invasive, some strains, um, you know, able to, you know, metabolize this or live in the bloodstream versus the urinary tract. Um, so that tells us about the genome structure, but also sequencing the bacterial genomes, we can also pick up mutations that have occurred either as insertions, deletions, or mutations. This is a project that um, we did in my lab from the NIH, for the NIH Clinical Center where we had three different bacterial strains that were, that were um, of an acinetobacter that were circulating in the hospital, and we wanted to understand what is the phylogenetic relationship. So we sequenced these three genomes, and then these, um, exactly as I told you, they formed contigs, um, and now we're using Marco Mara's program Circos which uh, was actually designed for cancer genome sequencing, but I can tell you it's perfect for microbial genomes, which actually are circles. We now are looking at it, and what we're looking at is any time that there's these three different strains that were in the NIH Clinical Center in 2007, we're looking at strain A, and we're saying any time that strain A is different than the reference to which we lined this, you code that SNP blue. Anytime B is different than A, you code it as red. Anytime C is different than B or different than A, you code it as green. And what you can see is that these three genomes are different, but they're different because there have been these regions of homologous recombination. There are also SNPs that distinguish them, but really um, it, what was confusing to us was that there are these blocks that you can now see are blocks of homologous recombination when you line them up like that. And that allowed us, sorry, that allowed us to then understand the phylogenetic relationship that B and C were more closely related to each other than they were to A. And if you look at these blocks of recombination, this is exactly what you're seeing is that um, this is again Marco Mara's program where you're seeing it now as a pinwheel. So these, um, see, these genes here from A are um, identical and found in B and found in C, but in fact, these genes in the middle region, this is defining exactly the block of recombination. Um, these genes are all unique to A, B, and C, and these um, encode actually the O antigen biosynthetic locus that is on the, ex um, on the outside of the cell and is used um, 
for detection by the human immune system. So this is an example where you really get down into the nitty gritty of understanding the different um, bacteria. So I've sort of talked about bacteria, I've talked about fungi. I, um, I sort of want to give a, a, a two minute shout out to viruses because I think this is going to be another really important area of microbial genomics, um, but it's the hardest one, um, which is to find um, novel viruses um, or even to understand what is the viral diversity that lives, you know, again, on us. Um, and it's the hardest because um, you really have to do sort of de novo sequencing and there's RNA viruses, DNA viruses, you have to think about what are you going to use as your control. Um, but I wanted to just sort of show this as one example where um, they use genomic sequencing um, to identify a novel virus. This was a case of um, um, someone who was an organ donor and then the three people who received um, organs from this person who, of course, these three people are now immune suppressed because they've just received organ transplant. They then all died um, within a month from um, this fever and this sepsis. And so the question is, was there an underlying viral um, um, origin to these tissues? So what you can do is then these can all be sequenced independently, but you're really looking here for the needle in the haystack. Um, you're looking for something that you see in these sequences that you never see in the human genome. So I'm sorry, this ended up finding a novel arena virus. Um, this type of method has also been used for finding um, Merkel cell carcinoma. Um, but this really, um, you know, for diarrheas, this is really um, an area that needs a lot of, um, you know, sequence being thrown at it. Um, so coming back even to the regulatory issue of, you know, how are we going to keep a healthy microbe? Um, you know, sequencing is just the start. If you want to talk about a microbe being associated with a disease, then historically you should satisfy Cox's postulates that the microorganism is found in abundance from, or, you know, from organisms suff suffering from the disease but not in healthy animals. You should be able to isolate it in culture and then transfer it into a healthy organism and recreate the disease. It's not clear to me that when we now start to think about microbiome, that it is going to be individual organisms. It may really be that it is, that you get an introduction of something like vancomycin-resistant enterococci, you know, the VRE, but that is only pathogenic in the context of limited microbial diversity of the gut, and that perhaps if there is a VRE, but there's also sufficient amounts of the commensal bacteriodes that they would keep that VRE in check. Um, so that makes it difficult for us to move. I mean, the sequencing is all about generating hypotheses, but then thinking about how we're going to test them um, becomes complicated because we may not be able to satisfy what are the original tenants. In the last few minutes, I'm just going to talk about what is the most complex part of what we do, which is metagenomics. Um, so again, I was saying this and, um, you know, about the spaceship coming down and sequencing the DNA from all those people in the middle of the crosswalk in New York, but that's really what we um, would like to ultimately achieve, which is to understand who are all the players all together, um, which would get us all the bacteria, fungal, viral, archaeal DNA all together. Um, in some cases, probably you'd also generate human DNA um, it, it, uh, because the bacteria live in such intricate association with the human. You would end up, you will end up with a very complex mixture and the computational analysis is very complex. So what do I mean by that? With, with metagenomics, you know, and we sort of talked about this in the context of the pan genome. Um, you know, that y you could imagine that you'd be looking at two different populations um, and that, again, you know, that 
you know, you see the pink, the green, and the blue, but it's really about getting at the level of the green gene um, is um, enriched and the pink gene is reduced in this population. Um, and you wouldn't get this by looking at 16S because maybe these are all the same type of bacteria, but within that type of bacteria, they have diversity. So for example, when I look at 16S sequences, I can't tell you if this is a methicillin-resistant staph epidermidis or this is a methicillin-sensitive staph epidermidis. So I would need to do this kind of um, metagenomic sequencing to understand what is really in those genomes. Um, but oftentimes, the, the sequences will then be um, discontinuous. Um, so in humans, there are the first studies of metagenomics. There has been a lot of metagenomic sequencing, also from um, this group MetaHit. Um, and it's generated a lot of controversy about how many different types of gut microbiomes are there? Are there two? Are there seven? Are there eight? Um, how many different vaginal types are there? Are there five? Are there three? And you know, what we're getting at here is what is the diversity that constitutes normal and what is going to constitute dysbiosis or, you know, deviations from the norm. And there's a lot of room for argument here because we have not yet solidified how we will analyze these rich, um, complex microbiome sets. So the tools don't yet exist to um, catalog and comprehend microbiome data. These are from the um, human gut microbiome. And, you know, what's really kind of sad about this is that you have this rich data set, and then you can, from this, sort of look at what bacterial phylum are present or what keg cog terms are present, and they look fairly similar. But in fact, you're taking a very um, detailed um, information set and you're reducing it to sort of 20 categories. And that may not be the level of resolution that you need to really understand what are the differences between these two bacterial communities. But it's really hard to know, you know, at what altitude you need to be looking at this kind of metagenomic data. Metagenomic data has been very useful in these types of experiments where um, you're looking for new metabolic enzymes. Um, you know, and this is sort of in terms of what are the new energy sources that the, um, you know, that the world could be harnessing. So the two energy sources that have been examined from a metagenomic um, perspective is the termite hindgut. You know, so how does it take wood and create that into energy? The, um, the cow rumen, so, you know, what they do is they put this into the cow stomach and, um, you know, they incubate it and then they look at what bacterial they will find in that cow rumen um, after that food has been digested. And they're using this, they're actually from, in these cases, they're getting to a level of specificity where they know that they're looking for certain classes of enzymes and they can find these with metagenomics. So these are some of the examples where metagenomics is now being used to find new enzymes that could be used um, in energy production. Um, but in terms of the human genome, uh, we really still need some computational tools to think about not if you're looking at one, you know, looking for one gene, but if you're looking at the whole classification, how would you really deal with metagenomic complexity? Um, and that is just very much an open question. So that's my presentation for today. Thank you all for coming and um, for participating in the um, course series. It's really um, uh, a pleasure for NHGRI to host this. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for a comprehensive presentation. And it uh, looks like we are still in the process of discovering more some of those.
variations and all their implications. And so since we are putting all the money, is there any way we could get something back in terms of uh, investment? I attended a talk on autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the presentation, uh, it was a beautiful talk showing us what are the issues. And then uh, the question came out that maybe right. we need, our immune system is so aggressive that we need more challenges from them every day. So, right. so, the, the, right. so the question is, I asked, so what is a good system? They say, we need a good parasites. I say, okay, what is a good parasite and where we should put them? In what body cavities, on the skin, gut, or somewhere else? So since you are covering some of the areas, you think we could get some mileage out of these sequences? And right. So I think that in terms of human disease, I think the first pr progress um, will be in the context of using the microbiome as biomarkers in the sense in the same way that you know a diabetic checks their blood sugar level we would hope that a kid who has eczema would be able to check their my, their skin microbial diversity and see when they were about to have a flare um, so, so that's one possibility. I think in the intensive care units, it would be used on a rectal swab to say, is this antibiotic basically, um, you know, doing something bad to the person's, um, you know, uh, GI population that this person is now at increased risk for developing a VRE infection. Um, more generally, in terms of health, you, you're um, you're getting to the ideas of Stan Falco and Marty Blazer um, that we've gone through these bottlenecks and that we're not properly educating our immune system because, um, first of all, we're, the, the use of antibiotics um, in early life and lack of understanding of how that may affect kids six months and a year later and 20 years later and 40 years later. Um, it, there is something called the hygiene hypothesis that believes that kids who are in, you know, that shows kids in daycare or kids on farms um, have less allergic disease. But I think that's why we just sort of really need a baseline to understand what is the microbial diversity now and are we messing with it, you know. And, you know, in the same way that my husband would love to see what Chicago looked like 500 years ago, I'd love to know what the microbiome looked like 100 years ago before we started using antibiotics and also the urbanization of our society. So we also use a lot of antibiotics after a lot of infections and other things. So what is a good way to repopulate the good bacteria in your gut? Uh, um, you know, I... I I, I certainly have to um, encourage people to take antibiotics if you have strep throat. Um, and I don't really, you know, I think Activa is a marketing genius, but it's not clear to me that it changes the microbial diversity of your gut if you're a normally healthy individual. Um, and so I, I don't really have any um, comments other than, you know, eat a healthy diet, get exercise, and don't smoke. <laughs> Generalized health recommendations. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, let's take a moment to thank Julie once again. For